everybody uh, this evening to this uh, QP and Council of Canadians co-sponsored event. My name is Lynn Fernandez and I'm going to be uh, uh, chairing everything tonight. I hold the Errol Black Chair in Labour Studies at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And so it's appropriate here that I'm here tonight to, to help with the town hall. Errol Black, who was a, a longtime Labour activist, of course, cared very deeply about health care, and he understood the role that labor played in securing Canada's public health care system. You are all here this evening, I think, because you care about health care, um, as most Canadians do. Indeed, the only Canadians who seem to be opposed to our public health care system are those who would benefit from its demise. The average Canadian understands the need to keep our system public, and protecting the integrity of the Canada Health Act. Now, I work for the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, which is a nonpartisan uh, research institute dedicated to evidence-based research on public policy. And I can tell you that the, Ca the Canada Health Act is solid gold public policy. Now, whenever new policy is launched that threatens logical, proven policy like the Canada Health Act, it's the CCPA's role to fight back. And that's why I'm here tonight, to help in this educational session on the threat to our health care system. Now, tonight's event is kicking off a campaign here in Winnipeg um, with a focus on the Elmwood Transcona area. We have with us tonight three top-notch speakers who are going to engage with us about the changes that came into effect as of March 31st. Specifically, they're going to talk about the expiry of the health accord and explain how that will undermine the National, uh, National Health Act. Um, and uh, tonight you're going to learn about the federal funding cuts that are going to put our system under threat and result essentially in 13 different health care systems across the country with varying degrees of compliance with the National Health Act. You're also going to learn what you can do to push back against this illogical and poorly thought out change to what many of us consider to be the most important public policy in Canada. Now, tonight, um, as, you, as I said, this is going to be a, this is kicking off a campaign to protect, strengthen, and expand Medicare. And as I said, we're going to be uh, learning about the health cord and why this, the significance of the fact that it's expiring. And as you can see, it was a 10-year agreement which expired on March 31st, 2014. And, and it increased federal health care funding by 6% per year. And it committed the leaders, uh, the provincial leaders, and, and, the, and the, the provincial and federal governments to the, to the Canada Health Act. And it set wait times and, and other goals. Um, we are going to also be seeing about what the implication is going to be to Manitoba once this comes into full effect and what the health care transfer cuts are going to mean um, to Manitoba, and, and Tim Sale is going to be talking about that. We'll probably go back to this uh, chart when uh, later on in the talk. And then we're going to learn about what we can do um, to prevent this, and uh, there's all kinds of activities that I'm going to be explaining throughout the evening, uh, things we're going to be encouraging you to, to, to sign up to and get involved in, and um, also we're going to keep going back over these websites so that you know where you can go, where the resources are, um, for you to, to um, come back over this. At the end of the session, when the speakers are done giving their presentations, there's going to be time for you to share your stories with us, uh, ask questions, but we'd really like to hear some stories too, not just straight out questions. What have your experiences been with the healthcare system? What are your family's uh, experiences been? What is really important to you? And you know, do you have any particular fears about what you think is going to happen? Um, w when, when the accord completely expires and, and the funding cuts start. So that's a bit of a roadmap of where we're going for this evening. And now I'm going to uh, just go over our speaker's bio so you, in case any of you aren't familiar with, with uh, who our speakers are, give you a bit of background. And then I'm going to invite our, our first speaker to get started. So we're going to start with Paul Moist. And Paul is a Winnipegger and the national president of the Canadian Union of Public Employees, or CUPE, which is Canada's largest union with more than 620,000 members. Paul became a CUPE member in 1975 as a City of Winnipeg employee. 
He served as CUPE uh, Manitoba president, Manitoba president for six years, and he has served as national president since 2003. Paul is a firm believer in the labor movement as a force for social change, and Moist has used his leadership to, champ to champion public services such as health care, education, and municipal services. He has led CUPE in opposing privatization and advocating for increased literacy, improving the socioeconomic conditions of Aboriginal peoples and human rights nationally and globally. In 2012, Paul was honored by the University of Manitoba's Faculty of Arts with the Distinguished Alumni Award. We're very happy to have you with us here tonight, Paul. Um, next, we have Tim Sale. Now, as a community activist on housing issues, Tim Sale continues his long and varied contributions to Manitobans. Tim is an ordained Anglican minister, was on the board of the Winnipeg United Way, and the head of Winnipeg Social Planning Council for 10 years. He served as an MLA for nine years, and during that time was Minister of Family Services and Housing, Minister of Energy, Science and Technology, and finally Minister of Health. Um, so uh, Tim is obviously going to have a lot of insights he can share with us um, because of his background. In 2007, he retired and did not seek re-election. In 2008, he was awarded an honorary doctorate by St. John's College of the University of Manitoba in recognition of his work for social justice. Tim remains active on this front in his retirement, and we are very happy that he can join us this evening. Maud chairs, Maud Barlow chairs the board of the Washington-based Food and Water Watch, and she is the recipient of 11 honorary doctorates, as well as many awards, including the 2005 Wright Livelihood Award, which is known as the Alternative Nobel. Please join me in giving Maud a warm welcome. Okay, I'm gonna ask Paul uh, to get up and, and get the evening rolling. Thanks, Paul. Thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's kind of quiet in here. This is a nonpartisan event. They won this seat by 300 votes in 2011. In 2015, we're going to defend Medicare and take this seat back for a pro-Medicare candidate. I'm glad I got that out of the way. And I, I, I am a proud Winnipegger, as Lynn uh, did in the intro. And it's a great privilege for me to share the stage with uh, Lynn Fernandez. We're all supporters of the great work of CCPA Manitoba and two great Canadians, our former health minister and f founding member of the Choices Coalition, Tim Sale, and a great Canadian, my good friend, Maude Barlow. Welcome to Winnipeg, both of you. Now today, Maude and I had a piece published in the Free Press, and as they're wont to do, they put a contrary point of view from the Fraser Institute right beside us. And uh, the Fraser Institute would fail economics first year with their analysis that, gee, there's more money in 2024 than in 2014. Who says they're cutting health care? Our methodology in the article that Maud and I wrote is that followed by three territories and all 10 provinces that, as we'll talk about tonight, there is a cut in health care spending. What you need to use to accurately measure health care spending is real per capita public spending, which has been falling since 2010, falling by about 1% annually. And real per capita measure is the best because it takes into account the impact of population growth, automatically 1.1% increase a year, takes into account average inflation, and it takes into account increased costs associated with an aging population. You could have a population that's falling like Nova Scotia, but it's an aging population and their health care costs are rising. So a 4% increase in health care allows you to tread water, which means necessarily that what that graph shows you is a cut. So I say to our friends in the Fraser Institute, the Manning Institute, the C.D. Howe Institute, the Council of Chief Executive Officers, the CFIB, the CTA, our parents and our grandparents fought to create universal 
public health care, and we're going to fight like hell to keep universal public health care. Now, I think the Manning Institute has also adopted the federal governments. We'll talk about health care exclusively tonight, but I can't resist, as reported in national newspapers, our federal government, I think the Manning Institute is in this economics uh, bent, they are calculating skills shortages as opposed to an unemployment problem in Canada. They say we have a no unemployment problem in Canada. And they're using as one of their sources, they reject Statistics Canada, Kijiji. <laughs> so being the old researcher that I am, we went to Kijiji and these are three Kijiji job postings. This is what our federal government is using to measure skills shortages. So from a recent Kijiji job posting, looking for someone to play tuba and follow Rob Ford around. <laughs> Hiring a new coach for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Serious inquiries only. I love telling that one in Toronto. Now this one is Maud's favorite, and I'll tell you why. This is from Kijiji, a job posting. Private firm wishes to hire time traveler to deliver confidential letter. <laughs> and Maude's applying for that job. Yeah. Now if Maude applied for that job and went back to 1987 and told them the devastation of free trade, we might not have had the free trade agreement. So let's all support Maude as she embarks on new careers. <laughs> but that's evidence in 2014 federal government style. So I want to welcome all of you here tonight. Maude and I did a couple of these last fall. Uh, town hall meetings as part of a national campaign uh, to talk about public Medicare. 46 actions on March 31st across Canada, the day the last 10-year accord expired. This town hall tonight is one of 10 where we've picked federal ridings that the Conservatives won, narrowly won in 2011. And those ridings, like this one tonight, are in play in 2015. I want to thank the members of CUPE working with Council of Canadians activists uh, from CUPE Manitoba, Kelly Moist, Rick McAlpine, Larissa Smirchansky-Sims, Gina McKay, Ryan McRae, Darlene Payat, and Debbie Boisson, oh, just to name a few. These folks have been out leafleting so far, 4,500 flyers in this riding, 500 conversations so far on the doorstep, and our goal 15,000 conversations in Elmwood, Transcona to talk about public health care. Thank you to these campaigners. So our goal is to draw attention to this federal retreat from funding Medicare and to defeat Conservatives in 2015. So the background to this debate is important. It's well known by this crowd, but it's worth mentioning in poll after poll in any region of Canada, the number one social program in the minds of Canadians is Medicare. Federal funding, Tim and Maude and I were talking just before we came in tonight, 50%, 50 cent dollars from the federal government and the advent of Medicare. By 2024, at the end of this new 10-year deal, uh, it will have fallen to under 13%. In most of our working lifetimes. The Canada Health Act, for those who say there isn't a role for the federal government, enacted by the federal government in 1984, laying out the principles that you're all aware of. Public administration, comprehensiveness, universality, portability, and accessibility. The, two, the 2004 to 14, the previous health accord, saw $41 billion in funding uh, committed over that 10-year period. That was to redress a massive downloading that occurred in the 1995 federal liberal budget. The Krejcian government had balanced the, back, the books, Canada's books, on the backs of provinces and territories. 2004, under Mr. Martin, simply redressed that to some degree, those past uh, errors, that we would argue, in budgeting. In December 2011, the former federal finance minister, the late Jim Flaherty, announced the new 10-year deal at a meeting of provincial finance ministers. No negotiations, no talks, no first minister's meetings, no further meetings with health care ministers. It was Harper unilateralism 
pure and simple. The new 10-year arrangement caps federal transfer increases after 2017, certainly after the next federal election, to increases of 3%. And we all know that given healthcare inflation, driven by rising pharmaceutical drug costs, the net effect of the New Deal compared to the just expired arrangement will see $36 billion removed nationally from our cherished health care system. And as Lynn put up on the board here, $1.3 billion or $1,055 per Manitoban. The federal retreat from the commitment to health care is much more than a $36 billion cut, as significant as that is. It also includes the federal government walking away from discussions with the provinces to control the cost of drugs and forge a national drug coverage program, a commitment in the previous health accord ended by Harper. Closing, they closed the Health Council of Canada, the group responsible for monitoring the status of health care in our country. They cut health care for veterans, cut refugee coverage, refused to uphold the Canada Health Act protections for patients against user fees and extra billing, walked away from discussions with the provinces about the provision of coverage for home and continuing care, downloaded responsibility for a range of RCMP veterans and refugee health services onto the provinces, also closed and eliminated federal funding from the National Council of Welfare, the Health Canada Library, the National Network on Environments and Women's Health, the National Aboriginal Health Organization. And these are just the health-related cuts in the eight years of the Harper regime. Harper's unilateralism and ideological approach is transforming our country. Consider the elimination of the long-form census, the silencing of scientists, the rejection, rejection of climate change, the Senate scandal. Nigel Wright might be avoiding charges from the RCMP, but when the chief of staff of the Prime Minister of Canada gives $90,000 to shut the mouth of a crooked senator, that's wrong and Harper should take responsibility right. for that. And now, legislating away the right of Canada's independent election officer to encourage Canadians to vote. Abuse of the temporary foreign workers program. Gutting the employment insurance program. Canadians deserve much better than they're receiving from their federal government. Medicare represents our commitment to one another as citizens. It defines us as Canadians. It's always been a shared federal, provincial responsibility. Medicare's defense and expansion to include a universal pharmaceutical program and a national long-term care program are issues worth fighting for. Canadians get it. That's the response we get on the doorstep universally. In Summerside PEI, where Maud and I spoke at a town hall not unlike this in September, at the end of the door knocking, we're at the beginning of the campaign here in Elmwood Transcona, but at the end of two weeks of campaigning, 2,300 completed conversations on the doorstep in, health, in Fisheries Minister Gail Shea's riding. How did we know we had an effect on the doorstep in PEI? She put out a press release two days after our town hall saying CUPE and the Council of Canadians lied. And I wear that like a badge of honor. The only lie going on is this big lie destroying Medicare and we can't let that happen. So together we can win this fight to defend Medicare on the doorstep one voter at a time by holding politicians accountable, by keeping this issue and these statistics alive, by keeping the cuts that I talked about alive, when someone knocks on a door in Elmwood Transcona looking for a conservative vote, they should hear back about questions about why are you destroying our flagship social program. We believe in Canadians in, in a shared responsibility, that it doesn't matter who you are, what your lot in life is, whether you live in Gander, Newfoundland, or Victoria, British Columbia, or anywhere in between, you and your family should not have your entire life interrupted financially 
by a catastrophic ailment. So many countries around the world have not got that question right. Our parents and our grandparents lived in times prior to Medicare as we know it. And we should never stop dreaming about improving Medicare, but that system that binds us together that says no matter who you are, no matter how big your purse or your wallet, we stick together and provide for one another. That's what public Medicare is about. It's worth fighting for, and it's worth fighting back here in Elmwood, Transcona, and reclaiming this seat where it belongs for the new Democratic Party of Canada. That was a great send-off. Thanks very much. It was a good way to get everything started. So uh, with that, Tim, would you please uh, come up and share your thoughts with us as well? Tim Sale. Boy, Paul, if that was nonpartisan, I want to hear one of your partisan speeches. <laughs> was, you know, when I came in here, I was, I was offered the opportunity to uh, spin the misfortune board back there, and I got a bill from Florida Medical Center just because I got dehydrated. I'm, I'm not sure how I did that but $3,531.50, um, and I'm, I guess I'm going to have to see if I can get some help from CUPE to pay it, because I'm in, I'm in deep trouble. Well, I'm apparently the ham and the sandwich here tonight, uh, but I'm honoured to be on a panel with two great Canadians. Paula and Maude have never stopped defending the social fabric of this country. A lifetime of commitment for justice to workers, and by extension, when there's justice for workers, there's the possibility, at least, of justice for all Canadians. Because when there's justice and respect for labour, a nation can be healthy. And when there is not, a nation will not be healthy, and it will not be healthy in some very specific ways. And I'll talk about those a bit in a few minutes. To Maude, whose most recent work, and I forgot to bring it so I could have gotten her to sign it, and then it'd be worth a lot of money someday. Blue Future. She lays out some of the bleak realities facing our planet. Has anybody read Blue Future, Blue Future yet? Some people have. Well, get it, get it and read it. It's, it's, a, it's a stark uh, laying out of what happens when you compromise nation after nation's fresh water supplies, whether it's through draining aquifers or polluting open water sources, whatever the reasons are. Uh, a very small proportion of the water in this world is drinkable in the first place. And when you begin to use it the way we're using it to frack natural gas, for example, uh, oil refining is tremendously expensive, and Maud has, Maud has laid out these issues really clearly. And, and I think all Canadians owe her a, a debt of thanks for laying out those issues so clearly. Never, never have these two great citizens become resigned to the results of short-term thinking and the worst of greed on the on the part of actually relatively few who exercise immense power. So I've always believed that the most effective way to move somebody is to tell a story. Now, many of you will not have known about this book because it's now quite old. Uh, it was put together by senior citizens in Ontario simply to gather stories about what it was like before Medicare, coast to coast, north to south, small communities, large cities. They're wonderful stories, and if I had some way of getting this republished, um, and perhaps a bit updated, but just republished, it would be wonderful. When I was health minister, I used to take this with me. I'd read a story from Manitoba and leave a copy and say, for heaven's sake, when you've read all the stories, share it around, because it's stories that tell you what it was really like, and I'm gonna tell you one today. The year's 1965. It's a year before the Hospital Insurance and Diagnostic Services Act came into effect. The place is the Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto, Ontario. My partner, Irene, was an ICU nurse in that hospital in 1965. I was a, a kept man at that point. I was finishing university, and uh, she was keeping me, thank goodness. She, uh, she was on, on the floor, and a four-year-old boy came in from northern Ontario a very, very sick little boy with obvious severe neuro neurological symptoms. Not clear what the problem was, but severe, severe symptoms. Lying in a crib, but unable to get even routine blood work, let alone the more sophisticated tests that were possible, because a young couple from Northern Ontario 
had no health insurance. The child could stay in hospital. That was covered publicly for people who are indigent. But not blood tests, not a simple hemoglobin. And the sign above his crib said, no diagnostic work. Now, Irene wasn't his nurse, so she doesn't know whether the child lived or died. But that's a real story from only that many years ago, 1965. That's not that long ago. That's what it was like. And that's why we fight for Medicare. For that child, whether he lived or died, for the parents of those, that child and those children, many, many like them today. For us old geezers, and there's a couple of us in the room, not too many, you know, but there's a couple of us, we do tend to have more health issues than uh, some of the young folks that are in the room. But we also need to fight not just to keep this system, but to renew it, to grow it, so that some of the things Paul talked about become an integral part of the system. You know, those who say that Medicare has not been able to restrain health costs are simply wrong because the costs that Medicare was put in place to restrain were physician costs and hospital costs. Those costs, in fact, have been quite effectively restrained. But the big elephant in the room today is drugs because multinational drug companies make an exorbitant amount of money on new drugs and they evergreen the patents on those drugs so that the little you know, twist in something in the pill entitles them to some more patent coverage. So if you want to get costs really under control, have a national pharmacare program that puts pharmacare under Medicare so you can bulk buy drugs so that those who So that those today, like that very, very fine physician, Dr. Daniel Martin, who is now on CBC's health panel, says in her own practice, she has patients who can't and aren't then able to fill their prescriptions for, in some cases, life-saving drugs, in other cases, chronic illness drugs. Why is diabetes so badly controlled in this country? Because people are not able to get the preventive care, and then when they need it, the, the ongoing chronic care, uh, our, our system isn't delivering that very well. So it's not just protecting what we have, it's having a vision of a system that's bigger, a system that meets a broader range of needs. Now, how do we do that? Well, first of all, let me be nonpartisan and say that we should be supporting federal political parties that promise to maintain and improve and grow grow Medicare that are committed to a national pharmacare program in particular and a program for long-term community care of senior citizens and those who need community care but for whom Medicare does not cover those in-home services. That's the first thing. We need to fight with and on behalf of Aboriginal Canadians, so many of whom live under third world and in some cases if you've ever been in some of the communities, these are communities that are worse than some third world communities in terms of the conditions in, under which people live. We usually associate third world communities with places that are warm. These places aren't warm. We usually associate third world communities with places that have some food available to them. These places don't have much in the way of food available to them, particularly those ones where pollution has, has ended the fishing supply, for example, and the English River would be one, of, one such example. Can you tell me, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely interested, this is not entirely a rhetorical question, can you tell me any other place in the developed world where 12,000 people live without a hospital or at least an advanced care clinic? Can anybody tell me of any place in the world where that, in the developed world where that happens? Somebody's nodding, where? <laughs> well, developed, okay. Uh, Okay, I guess I'm raising the bar a little bit from Russia. I was in Russia in the 1990s with the Mennonite um, Economic Development Group looking at Russian health care when they were beginning to think about moving into a more Western point of view. Stunning, stunningly awful for ordinary people and amazing for the officers uh, and politicians. Stunningly awful for ordinary people. I'll tell you where that community of 12,000 people is. Does anybody know? Garden 
Hill, Red Sucker Lake, Wasagamak. 12,000 people live there. No hospital. No hospital and not much in the way of health care. The obscenity and stupidity, and both those things I think are important adjectives, of cutting off health care to our most recent Canadians, refugees in particular. You take people from Sierra Leone who have, who have seen the most horrific, horrific situations of torture and executions, mutilations, and you bring them here as a compassionate nation, and then you say, but you don't get health care. That is both obscene and stupid because those people need care and they will get it, but they'll just get it at a much higher cost when they really need it badly. We need to ask why we medevac virtually every pregnant woman from Manitoba, northern Manitoba. Why do we do that? Sixty million dollars worth of medevacs from Aboriginal communities in northern Manitoba. $60 million a year. Now that was when I was health minister, so seven years ago. But more important, we're trading off a very small reduction in the risk of pregnancy, and it's real, real risk. But what's the social risk of tearing a woman out of a family context, of taking her away from her children, if she already has some children, taking her away from her partner, what would it be like to live in a small community where there was never a baby born? What would that say to you about that community? And yet, in huge parts of the world, midwives do exceptional work, including, not just with low-risk cases, but including medium and even high-risk cases. I remember a story of an obstetrician in St. Boniface Hospital here talking, not a midwife, but just a nurse through uh, a very complicated delivery that uh, uh, I can't tell you all of the, the complication, but it was incredibly complicated delivery. He talked her through that delivery. The delivery was successful. The mother lived. The child lived. We can deal with, with births in remote communities. We can train Aboriginal midwives, many of whom will be daughters of the traditional midwives that delivered all those babies in times past mostly safely and we would change the social risk and change the fabric of those communities that never see a baby born. What would it be like to live in that kind of community? But the real battle, my friends, is an underlying battle. Yeah, it's about Medicare, but it's an underlying battle. It's a battle as old as civilization. It's written about in the Bible, which I have some affection for. And it's the battle for the just and fair allocation of what economists call rent. And that is payment for things you use but you don't own. I don't mean the rent for your apartment or the rent for a car that you needed because your car broke down. I mean the transactions that pay for stuff. And I'll give you some examples. And you know them because you're union members and you've been, to, you've been to school. Wages are the rent that capital pays for labor. Interest is the rent that capital pays for money it borrows, but it doesn't own. And when we get stuff out of the ground or we use stuff like water, we sometimes pay rent for that too. Manitoba, uh, Manitoba Hydro pays water rentals to the Manitoba government for the water they use to generate power. Royalties for gas and oil, that's a kind of rent. It should be much higher than it is because it's a non-renewable resource. Water at least is renewable as long as we look after it. And from time immemorial, there's been a battle over these rents. This is not a new battle. It didn't start with the start of the union movement. It started as soon as there was the allocation of capital to fewer and the allocation of labor to more. That goes right back to biblical times and before. Apart from the relatively golden age of the 1950s and 60s, relatively golden age, labor's never had enough power to successfully extract fair rent for its work. Capital, on the other hand, has mostly had the upper hand and increasingly, from 1980 onwards, has managed to do two key things. And these are really important things for all of us, I think, to understand and be able to, to, un to understand why they're so critical to what's happened to our country in the last, uh, oh, 30, 35, 40 years. The first thing it's done is successfully diminished both the role and respect 
the role of and respect for government. If you can make people think that government's wasteful and evil, it's much easier to reduce its power. That was the great gift of Thatcher and Reagan, to a lesser extent Mulroney, but Thatcher and Reagan in particular, and the Fraser Institute, you know, is its, is its champion. If you can make people think that everything government does is wasteful or corrupt, then why would you be interested in voting? Why would you be interested in running? Why would you think it was an honorable profession? And if so, if you can demean the public enterprise, then it makes it much easier to control. Two minutes, she says. Well, I've got about half an hour here. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> capital has successfully waged an unremitting war on unions, on pensions, on workers' rights. Instead of what everyone, I think, hoped was that we would level up, we've been pushed to level down. But this, I believe, I believe in all my heart, is a false victory in an unwinnable war on the part of capital. Because history is clear that when capital gets too much control and workers are diminished, nations fail. Sometimes they fail in revolution, they're messy. They sometimes don't work, but they're not really very friendly to capital. More often they fail in slow decline. They fail because goods and services, even food and shelter, can't be bought with the wages of the day. In this city, and we're fortunate with the prices we have in this city because they're much lower than many parts of Canada. If you don't have an income of at least $46,000, you can't afford a two bedroom apartment. Now, you know, $46,000 is a lot more than some people make in their family. And according to CMHC, you can't afford a two bedroom apartment, let alone a house. In many other parts of the world, it's worse. So that's the real underlying battle we're in. First of all, it's a battle to elect governments that understand what a social contract is. What a, they understand that the unwritten relationship between a society and its government has certain givens, fairness, justice, health care, education, clean water, clean air, safety. And when that strong social contract is weakened, countries fail. Study after study shows that when income inequality is reasonable, we're not talking about equal, but inequality is reasonable, nations have stronger economies, safer communities, more innovation, lower disease rates, longer life expectancy. So in my last five minutes, my friends, we need a new government in Ottawa. Plain and simple, we need a new government in Ottawa. One. One that respects all Canadians, that actually upholds the rule of law. One that respects civil society. In my world in Right to Housing, a Housing Advocacy Coalition, we tried for five years to meet with somebody in the Conservative government that was elected. Vic Taves was, of course, the one we were trying to meet with. He not only would never meet with us, he wouldn't even respond to our letters. Now, I understand they have different views, but the disrespect I don't tolerate. I don't accept the disrespect for civil discourse, civil, civil dialogue. We need a government that understands that good public policy needs good independent research behind it, not muzzling every scientist that finds anything that might be truthful but inconvenient. One that knows in particular, and I know, Maud, this is your, this is your heart. One knows we only have one earth to cherish and only one atmosphere to breathe just the one. We don't own Canadian, you know, earth and Canadian atmosphere somehow isolated. No, it's one earth and one atmosphere. So the first step is a new government. And the only way you get there is to remain engaged and to get your friends engaged. Not going to happen by nature or by polls. It's going to happen by the hard work at the doorstep. Demanding support for an active civil society, civil dialogue, and you have to do that after the election too. One of our mistakes in Manitoba we elected an NDP government, we all thought that was great, and the left went away to a certain extent and did not hold us accountable the way it needed to do, because the right never quits. Sometimes the left says, my God, we finally got a government that's decent, we can take a rest. Don't do it. If we get a government in Ottawa that is a, a government that is friendly to Canadians, don't say it's a victory and walk away. Stay engaged. So let's leave here tonight working for justice and fairness for all.
younger, older, yes, for Medicare, but above all, for that new government in Ottawa. We can do it, you can do it. So glad I'm chairing this nonpartisan event here tonight. <laughs> I'm going to ask Maud to come up now and uh, please welcome Maud Barlow. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Lynn, and uh, thank you all for coming out um, on what's the beginning of a long weekend. I'm really, really impressed with this wonderful crowd. <clears throat> big shout out and thanks to Tim and, of course, my very dear friend, Paul Moist. Uh, big shout out to CUPE for all the work you've done putting this together and to the council chapter here. <clears throat> we are very dear friends and very dear allies together, and uh, we've fought many fights in the pa fights in the past, and we're going to fight Unfortunately, there's going to be more to fight in the future. We're going to be there um, for each other. There was a doctor, um, an Argentinian cardiac surgeon who was very famous in his country. His name was Rene, Dr. Rene Favalero. And Dr. Favalero was um, one of the first people to work on heart, heart bypass in the world. And he uh, was such a fine surgeon that he was offered any top job he wanted in the United States or Europe. And he chose to stay in his country and open a foundation and a clinic, a medical clinic, where he trained 450 heart surgeons all over um, Latin America. And he was very, very proud of the fact that he never, ever, ever, ever turned anybody away. If you had a lot of money, he let you give a little donation to his heart foundation. But it was supported by the Argentinian government, and it was a sign of real respect um, by uh, the people there. He was a real hero. Uh, in the late 1990s, Argentina went through an economic crisis. It went through an austerity program. They cut funding to this foundation. They cut funding to public health care. And René Favalero went into a, a, a kind of a frenzy trying to save his foundation. He petitioned the president, he said, I beg you, I beg you to use your influence. We cannot let this go. Um, poor people will have nowhere to uh, get the kind of surgery and health care they need. He wrote about being a beggar in his own country <clears throat> and wrote about feeling all alone. On July 29, 2000, he had a light lunch of tea and apple and then went into the bathroom and put a, a 14 caliber bullet through his broken heart. And he left the most incredible a suicide note and he said he talked about how ha having served having ha had a life serving public health care never ever ever turning anyone away he could no longer live with the pain of turning away poor people and watching his ch his society and his world change he said I cannot change and this is the words of the words he wrote in his in his suicide note he said I would rather disappear now, I tell you this story because when we are talking about health care, we are talking about life and death. And we are talking about people who are, have no choice in many parts of the world. And increasingly in our country, it's going to be like that if we lose this health care system. I really believe that the moment that we are experiencing now is the most important moment for our health care system since the inception of Medicare in the 1960s because we see the Harper government ruthlessly bringing in fundamental changes uh, to health care uh, and the, the breaking of this accord or the ending of this accord with the provinces and the refusal to sit down with the provinces and reintroduce um, an, a new accord. And I think it's very important for us to know one of the things I've been worried about is that because it's put off until 1917, it, or 2017, it can almost appear as if it's not happening immediately. I mean, Stephen Harper's a very smart man. And I think what I call him George Bush with brains. And I think what he's trying to do is profoundly and deeply and forever change our society. And the way you do that is you don't rush it. You don't make it obvious so that it becomes an election issue. You quietly put in place the dismantling of these fundamental institutions. And Tim spoke of, of, of so many of them. Uh, and then, of course, my other favorite bugbear is then you bring in trade and investment agreements that lock in the deregulated system. 
So it's important to know and to remember that Stephen Harper once led the National Citizens Coalition, the most horrible right-wing organization in our country, that was founded by a wealthy health insurance salesman named Colin Brown, who founded it to fight public health care and used to say that Medicare would kill millions of Canadians. He used to say that. The Har Stephen Harper was on record many times before he became Prime Minister on the need to give fiscal responsibility on health care to the provinces, and he's allowed the proliferation of private health care services across the country. I call it a death of a thousand cuts. So we need to be conscious that this is a very deliberate act. When you read media saying, well, we're running out of money, Paul, Paul spoke to this, we are not running out of money. Uh, we, we need to be conscious that they are using this process with the provinces to fundamentally change the nature of health care delivery in this country. But he knows the Canadians are deeply connected to and love our health care system. Uh, and so he knows he can't do it through an election or through the front door, so what he's doing is through the back door, which is a brilliant strategy for a man determined to kill public health care in Canada. <clears throat> he doesn't have to do the deed himself. All he has to do is systematically pull funding out of the federal level <clears throat> of health care delivery, and he knows that they will be turning it over to provinces, some of whom will then want to privatize on their own, and some of whom, of course, uh, won't have the funding to maintain the systems that we all need and, and deserve. So what we're going to do, we will end up with a patchwork of services, many of them privatized, and the end of a national health care program. The very heart of the promise of Medicare, which is that you can go to any province in this country or territory in this country and have equal access to physicians and hospitals, that will no longer apply. And the great last great universal social program in our country, the jewel in our programs in all, uh, in all of our, our, this crown will be gone, perhaps forever. And we need to remember that they're struggling in the United States, and Obama has said that they wish they had set up our type of program many decades ago, and he would never have had this um, fight to even bring in something that's not even anywhere near compat compatible to what we have. There are still 52 million Americans without health care uh, coverage in the United States, and they're <clears throat> beginning to try to tackle the problem with, of course, the great resistance that we're finding. I remember being in a visiting friends in Maine one day <clears throat> um, with my husband Andrew, and we came upon an accident up on the highway. A little boy had been hit on, on a little boy on a bike had been hit by a, a, a hit and run. The, the people took off. And we stayed with the little boy and the ambulance came. The ambulance was made up of volunteer workers. <clears throat> and uh, they said they couldn't take the little boy to hospital until they knew what kind of insurance he had. So we had, the little boy was okay enough to tell us where his parents' cottage was, sort of. I stayed with the child. Andrew went to find the children's uh, parents and they, who came running up and, and took charge. But I mean, they literally would not take this quite badly hurt child um, to hospital until they knew where to take him, what kind of hospital to go to. So we have a fight on our hands again, and it seems to be a recurring story. It is essential that we be prepared, <coughs> uh, which means that we have to mobilize now. And I think it's very important that we have our own narrative, that we're not just fighting to maintain the healthcare system that we have currently, but that we remember that when Tommy Douglas brought in, introduced healthcare, he said this was just the first half of what we would do. He eventually wanted to see a fully public um, system of delivery as well, not just of funding. So we have to say that it's not only sustainable, <clears throat> that public costs have stayed steady as a percentage of GDP, um, as the private uh, services and drug costs have gone through the roof, but that we have the right and we need uh, the, the right to demand universal compre comprehensive health care from cradle to grave. We need not only not the old accord, we need a new accord that protects, strengthens, and extends Medicare. We need one with no user fees, no private services, no extra building, billing. We need a national pharmacare program, a, a plan for continuing care, a proper funding for health care in First Nations communities, and a promise to keep health care out of all trade and investment agreements and um, take it out of any that it are currently being negotiated. <clears throat> and to remember the comprehensive economic and trade agreement with Europe would cause a dramatic increase in our drug prices and make it so that it would be impossible for any future government to ever implement national health, uh, pharmacare program. 
As Tim said, every generation has had to fight for Medicare, and I think it's important for us tonight when we're embarking on this very important journey to remember all those who've come before us and those who will come after us and the responsibility that we have se seven generations to come. Healthcare is a fundamental right, and it's a public good for which no financial barriers must be erected, and this is the fundamental promise of Medicare, and we, it's the promise that exists still. Canadians fought for this right. It cannot be taken away on the ideological whim of this government. We need a full commitment from the federal government to assume its historic responsibility in setting national standards that guarantees universal, comprehensive coverage to all Canadians. Nothing less than this is going to do, and no one, not even Stephen Harper, is going to be allowed to take this away from us. I think what we all need to remember <laughs> is that Stephen Harper was elected <clears throat> with only 25% of Canadians voting for him. <clears throat> if you counted those who didn't vote as well as the percentage vote he got, uh, he has no right, not that he cares about anyone in this room, but he has no right to impose his will on the people of Canada. And I think it's very important for us not to let the premiers off the hook. It's extraordinarily important for us to say to them, we expect you to, to fight back. Do not accept this as a fait accompli. Do not accept that the Harper government is walking away. And we have to really put the fi fire to the feet of the of the political opposition parties to tell us exactly what they would undo in terms of the, the changes that have been made. Tim talked about life before Medicare, and I just want to end by remembering this, the, this fight that was so ferocious. People lost their homes and their farms to pay for health care because the, we did not have universal funding. Half the young men called up for service in 1939 were rejected because of poor health. One remembers a mother dying on the steps of a hospital in Grand Prairie while her husband was inside begging them to take her in. Another remembers a young Ontario mother who had to sell her cows to pay for the hospital for her dead baby before the hospital would release the child's body. A Manitoba senior recalls a neighboring farm woman who was diagnosed with cancer. She knew that in order to get treatment at a hospital, her family would have to sell the farm. So she decided to die at home. And she asked her husband when he went out in the fields during the day to please lock the doors and the windows so that he and the neighbors wouldn't hear her, the pain that she was experiencing and her cries of pain. Um, her suffering lasted two months. She did die at home and she saved the family's farm. These were the kind of choices people had to make. When Tommy Douglas decided to bring in public insurance in Saskatchewan, he faced the private insurance industry, the Canadian Medical Association, the American Medical Association and the Saskatchewan College of Physicians and Surgeons who went on strike. To meet the health care needs of the people, a coalition of farmers, unions and health care workers set up 27 health care cooperatives that exist to this day. They brought in doctors from Great Britain, including two women doctors. One was named Dr. Joan Whitney, and the other was Dr. Joan, uh, Margaret Mahood. They had to be escorted by security guards to work because they were receiving regular death, death threats. The strike was reported, of course, all over the world. Of Tommy Douglas, the Vancouver Sun said this, this man Tommy Douglas is, well, a good deed in a naughty world. He is a breath of clear prairie air in a stifling climate of paola and chicanery and double talk and pretense. Well, we're here tonight to bring some clean, clear Winnipeg air to this struggle and to tell the premiers and the federal government that the Canadian people fought long and hard for our health care system and we are not about to give it up. So let's vow tonight to stand on guard for Medicare let, lest it be destroyed by stealth and lost in a myriad of betrayals. We owe it to those who came before us, like my own dad who served in the Second World War and, and gave his life to making Canada a better place. He actually led the fight against capital punishment in this country and he said it was amazing that the same government that didn't have the money to feed, house, clothe or employ anybody before the war all of a sudden had everything it needed. Uh, to provide all the social infrastructure. And they said, we came home from that war profoundly changed and we were not going to be put back in work camps and we weren't going to be told that we weren't worthy. Um, you know, some of us lost limbs, some of us lost friends, family. Um, we were all profoundly changed forever. And they came back, this great generation, and they created this first 
round of social, social security from uh, family allowance to seniors' pensions to uh, employment unemployment, then it was called um, unemployment insurance, and the jewel of this of these programs, which was our, our health care program. And we owe it to them. I feel, a, I, I personally feel that I owe it to my father and the fight that he put up, and my mom lost her first husband in that war, um, killed over the the British, uh, the, uh, in, in the Battle of Britain, and she didn't know for two years that he was gone. I mean, they suffered, and they came back, and they said, we're not going to let suffering derail us. We are going to set up a country to be proud of, what my dad used to call a social nation state, not a corporation, a social nation state. And we came together to build this, and it is now our turn to hold on to this. We are now the stewards. It's the baton is passed to us, if you will. And we have to hold it high because this is the greatest threat that we have seen to public health care ever, ever, ever in this country. And I have news for, for Stephen Harper. You will one day not be our prime minister, and we will still be here. Our health care system will be here. The values we love and care about will be here. You will not have, have done what you set out to do, which is change the, 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 the concept of Canadians of caring for one another and having the belief that no matter where you go in this country, you have these fundamental rights. These are our birthrights. They will be the birthrights of our, our children and their children for seven de de uh, generations to come. And Stephen Harper, you can't change that. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Maude. That was very inspirational. I'm going to take a second just to do a little bit of a recap. Um, once again, we've heard a lot of things, a lot of concept. We've talked about the National Health Act. We've talked about the, the, the Health Accord. Um, once again, it's the Health Accord that we are focusing on in this campaign. And it's this, as we know, it's this 10-year agreement. The Health Accord, I will remind you, it's a legal agreement between the federal and provincial governments on health care funding that runs from 2004 and 2014. It officially expired March 31st, 2014. The funding's going to continue until 2017, and then that's when everything starts changing. As Maude said, this is kind of the, the tricky part about this. We're not going to see a big change until 2017, and we have a federal election before that happens. The accord was important for a number of reasons. Um, the 2004 accord committed leaders to the Canada Health Act, that, that as Maud so nicely put it, that jewel of public policy. It set wait time and other goals, and it increased health care funding by 6% each year. And it provided stable funding after the severe cuts in the 90s, and this is something that both uh, Paul and Tim talked about. So this is what's at stake. This is what's expired. We're not going to see the effects of 2017, so we, you know, we're hoping that we can educate people about this. I want to now start inviting people to come up with their stories. Um, we've, all, we've heard some great stories from all of you. Um, so if you have some of your personal stories that you'd like to share with us, they don't have to be negative, they don't have to be scary. Um, we probably all have got some stories too about how wonderful our healthcare system has been. I know personally people who can't say enough about, for example, cancer care here in Manitoba. I've had people, I've had a very close friend who had ovarian cancer. She was blown away at the treatment that she got um, at, the, at the cancer clinic here and was so thankful. Her partner is American and she was so thankful that she was here and, and not in the States for that. She just could not say enough good about the level of professionalism, the care and the kindness um, that she got at, at a very stressful, the most stressful um, part of her life. So we, we can share stories like that too. Um, and, and if anybody has some questions or they want some more information about some of the details that we've been talking about, uh, you're welcome. So it looks like we have our first uh, question and or story. So please. Hello. Uh, my name is Uri Trujillo and I came to Canada in 77. I was so happy to know that we have uh, healthcare, but I didn't know how old was that, that, that uh, this product. I ended up living in a neighborhood with my side neighbor was Mrs. Neal. Mrs. Neal told me that when she came to Canada, she was an Irish lady, when she came to Canada, there was not a child of um, Medicare, it was either a um, family allowance. So his boy, only boy gets sick when she was, uh, when he was 
seven years old, and he had to have a um, vaccination, one needle a week, and he had to pay $10 a shot. It was so expensive that he ended up paying this, this loan when his son was married three years after. So that really broke my heart. So I thought, my God, we have this service. If we allow her to go to power, this might happen again, you know, 40 years after. Please, please, let's stop her. Thank you. My name is uh, Daniel Blakey, and I'm, I'm going to share a story that's not so much a personal experience with the healthcare system as a, as a client, if you will, although um, I, I have had some really great experiences with the public healthcare system, including uh, when our son Robert was born about 15 months ago, he was in the uh, NICU for a while, and the, the uh, nurses and the staff there were very supportive, and we just had an outstanding experience. So um, there are a lot of great stories about our healthcare system. But I want to talk to you a little bit. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm an electrician now, but I did at one time work for the uh, <coughs> Minister of Health. At that time, it was Teresa Oswald. It was just after Tim uh, vacated the office. And um, I guess this story is more so about the, the way that this federal money matters, if you will. Because you hear people say, oh, well, 6% a year, it's just a number, and you're just throwing money at the problem, and what does this money actually do? So you hear people say, oh, well, 6% a year, and it's just a figure, and they're throwing out money, and it's, it's political, but who knows where it's really going. Um, the money matters. One of the things that shocked me when I worked in the office, and Tim may know about this, but is that we often talk about a public health system, and we do have uh, a public health system in a certain sense, but it's not total. There, there are a lot of private actors, and so information in the health system is kind of hived off into little hermetically sealed compartments. And what shocked me sometimes was it, what we didn't know about wait times for certain kinds of surgeries and procedures because that information was kept in little isolated pockets. And, and actually, I think people often think that government has all that information at their fingertips and so they can identify those problems. But in fact, the information remains where it's collected at that local level. And, Government doesn't have a right to that information. It has to be disclosed. And in some cases, frankly, surgeons, doctors, uh, whatever it may be, don't want to give up that information. Um, and, and there are a lot of great people in the system, and they care. But you know, uh, so I don't want to be too crass. But in the same way that if I build decks for a living and I've got a client list, I don't particularly. If there's an 18-month wait for me to build your deck. I may know there's a guy down the street that could do it in two months, but I don't really feel like giving up my whole list of clients. I'm quite happy to have the work, thank you. So there are a lot of ways in which that information gets sealed off. But for the, but, but the areas where we knew what wait times were were the five areas designated in the Federal Health Report starting in 2004. And you'll forgive me if I don't remember them all, but I think they were hips and knees, uh, heart uh, surgery, cataracts. cancer, cataracts, and I'm going to forget the fifth one. But those ones we knew all the time. Because one of the things that's important to understand is that when you're the provincial government, you're, you're dealing and you're negotiating with the doctors and nurses and healthcare pro professionals. So when, you're, so when you're dealing with them directly, it's hard to say, well, we need you to give up that information because otherwise we won't flow the money to ourselves. Okay, so, so, so we're, what we're going here is maybe that um, if we had the health afford cover more things, maybe we'd do a better job. I think it gives, just on the point of premiers, for instance, uh, stepping up and provincial governments, I think it gives them real leverage with the actors in the system that they're negotiating with to say, look, we have a pot of money, but there's conditions that, that come with that. Okay. We didn't make it up. We're not, this isn't just coming from ourselves. Yeah. In order to be able to pay you, our money comes from here, and they have certain accountability structures. My name is uh, Jim Kane, and I'm a long-term HIV AIDS survivor. So I'm going to share a little bit of story with you because in the, I really, I really like the, the pamphlet that QP put out on pharmacare. I think that's very important. The one cautionary note that I have about it is the whole issue of speeding up drug approvals and or slowing them down. And you know, there's a history in the movement of HIV and AIDS where we had to kick bureaucratic arse to expedite 
clinical trials for drugs that were available in the U.S. or in Mexico, and they weren't available in Canada. And some of my peers died because of bureaucratic red tape. There needs to be, in my opinion, expanded international co cooperation when it comes to sharing information about safety and efficacy. Yeah, that sounds good. Very good. Thank you very much for that. Uh, my name is Chad Panting. I'm a lawyer. Uh, addressing this issue about the idea of this being a recurring issue in the event that the Conservatives were to ever regain power again, it's really simple. Section 7 of the Charter says you have the right to your life, liberty, and security of the person. Amend the Constitution so that the Section 92 powers that gives health care to the federal or to the provincial government puts the responsibility on the federal government so that they share it. And then this solve, problem is solved forever. Well, okay. Okay, let's take a few minutes here for our panel to respond to some of these comments. Paul, did you want to, to start? Well, just uh, very quickly, the stories from individuals is what's most powerful in these town hall portions, and the door knockers are getting the same thing all across Canada where we're talking about the important. I would just say to the last intervention, and I'll stop myself, that uh, the Charter has, has changed our country, and many might argue, for the better, but I wouldn't put all my eggs in the basket of, a, of, of the legal system. I think that social programs in the country we have are the result of uh, political struggle and social struggle, and no matter what our charter says, and it should, uh, it should enshrine principles and values, we all care about as Canadians, but uh, you can't sit back. We say in the labor world, negotiating a collective agreement is our framework, but enforcing that agreement, advancing that agreement, educating about that agreement, keeping that in a live document. In the age of cyberspace and unlimited communication, uh, we're not talking to each other or listening to each other as Canadians, which is why we're doing this tour. That's great. Tim, go uh, ahead. Briefly, uh, Daniel, I think, is, is quite right about the difficulty to get getting good information. Part of the health accord was uh, a national health council, Canada, Canadian Council on Health, that would do that. They would put out reliable data that uh, would help Canadians to understand what the situation really was with uh, particularly the five areas. Well, what did Harper just kill? Canada Health Council just killed him. He hates good research. He hates information on which people might make informed decisions, whether it's the Experimental Lakes area, which thank goodness Ontario and Manitoba got together to save, or whether it's scientific data on climate change. He simply does not like that kind of information. And to me, no developed nation that calls itself a democracy can function without good science. Because the issues we face today are complex. They're not simple. And so when Daniel talks about getting information on hips and knees, I'll tell you very briefly, I couldn't get it either. And so what I did finally was order that the waiting list be on my desk. I had to order it. They said, oh, I can't have that. It's got patients' names in it. I said, for God's sakes, I don't care who the patients are. You have a program. Blank out their names. I just want to know who's on the list in terms of how long they've been there. But you know what they showed me? That was kind of, it was interesting. They showed me the doctor's names for each patient. And I spent, and this is, I, I'm not trying to self-aggrandize myself, but I'm the Minister of Bloody Health. I spent a weekend around an enormous table sorting the waiting list manually, pieces of paper, into piles by doctor. This, is, this doesn't take a lot of intelligence. I was up to it. <laughs> and, and what I found? What I found? Two surgeons out of 18 had 84% of the wait list. Uh -huh. We had 16 vastly underemployed and younger and probably at least as well trained, and maybe better trained, than the two best guys. And why did that happen? It's because when Paul Moist got a bad hip, goes to his physician and he says, well, I've got to get a new hip. I want the best guy. And so the doc, who belongs to the St. Charles Country Club as well, says, well, you know, Charlie's, Charlie's the best, but he's got a long waiting list. And Paul says, I don't care. I want the best guy. And that's, of course, what happened. So it is hard to get good data. Friends, Harper is an enemy of good information. He's got to go on that count alone. Uh, I'm with the Social Planning Council, and every year we have eight nursing students who do their field placement with us. 
And I'll tell you, it's really, really inspiring to have these young people come. And uh, not only, I mean, they're there to learn about poverty, learn about housing, learn about community development. They're, they're engaging with us on a lot of uh, social and community issues. And I'll tell you, they're so enthusiastic to get outside of the institution and learn about community. And they all leave really enthusiastic. But what it, what it says to me, first of all, is about their commitment to our communities and uh, as well as to their patients. And secondly, the kind of institutions we've got here that are training really good, great healthcare people. And that, those are the kind of people we need to support. So that's the first thing. Second thing is a, th a thread that ran through all pre presentations and kind of was emphasized by Maude, is that healthcare depends on citizen engagement, on citizens kicking ass. So we give respect to Tommy Douglas and he deserves it, but he could only do what he did because there were a lot of people standing there behind him and with him. Not only the people forming the co-ops that Maude talked about, but just, you know, uh, labor people, workers, farmers, mothers, fathers, Everybody stood up because healthcare is universal. It is what it affects all of us. So the challenge is we've got to get off our asses and really stand up. You know, Tim was saying how you know the left has to continue to be uh, present, uh, and we do have to not just to defend uh, Medicare now, but to be persistent and make a lot of the other changes that are needed. So I think we need to revive the Manitoba Health Coalition so that we can stand up and keep fighting for health. question I want to check in with my friends at the back there are we moving the stuff there is it yeah yeah are kind of so so okay we got to pick it up a bit right before we're all going to be able to go home so don't forget go ahead please hi I'm Susan White I'm with the Canadian Women's Health Network I used to work for them now I work for free for them because we were one of the organizations hit in those cuts of that horror list that Paul uh, gave us, and I appreciated that he highlighted women's health. Uh, we were caught because we spoke out about uh, what the government wasn't doing right about women's health and what they could do better. But we were part of a larger program, the whole entire program was cut from Health Canada, and that eliminated another five women's health policy research organizations across Canada, and which ties in, uh, I felt like a bobblehead doll with when Tim was saying about how this government hates good information and research, and they 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 uh, eliminated a lot in terms of women. So um, we need to know, and we need to say when we're talking on doorsteps or on phones or whatever, that uh, this, I mean we, this government has been at war with women for years, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. And this is part of the war. Yeah. We need to know that because women use healthcare services more than men. Why? Partly it's our biology. We have children, right? And all the other things that go along with that. We also live longer than men. So if we're talking about chronic care, long term care, women are going to be the primary beneficiaries of that or will suffer. So when you're talking to people, talk to them about you know, their future and their grandmothers and mothers and their daughters. Uh, this is part of the war on women. Um, we can, you know, I think that that we need to bring out these stories, these stories about how women are affected. Um, and it's not to exclude men, obviously. Men should care about their wives and their mothers and their grandmothers and their daughters as well and bring out these stories. I would like to see us get out there more. Um, th this is part of the war on women. Um, thanks a lot. That's a that very good talk there. I, I will also remind you about these uh, websites, and I know one of them is uh, uh, a petition signing to send to your, M your MP, probably MLAs too. Maybe there's room in there for those stories. You know, often these petitions you can put in your own personal comments. So don't hesitate to be telling those stories when you go to these websites and you're sending your message to your the message to your politicians. Excellent. Uh, my name is Rick McAlpine, and I have uh, the very humbling honor to be a small part of organizing this uh, this campaign. Uh, and I'm, I'm overcome with how many of you are in this room right now, and how many of you get it. And, and people have said to me, oh, it must be a lot of work, and it is, but it's also very easy work because every single person we talk to about this, every single one of you that heard from us 
however you found out to be in this room, you're here because you know and you understand and you care. So I'm just here, uh, we, I want, want every single one of you to get up and tell your story uh, and, and talk to people and, and spread those stories. That's what's going to make this campaign go. So very quickly, I just wanted to let you know some of the things that we're doing. First of all, uh, Brother Dennis spoke to the Health Coalition. Uh, we are going to have a small uh, donation jar at the back there uh, to collect some seed money to get that going. We have uh, several people who have already committed to getting the Health Coalition back on the ground. So please give a couple of dollars if you can, and we're going to use that to get the Health Coalition back off the ground. There's also a sign-up sheet there if you'd like to help be a part of that. Uh, second of all, a large part of what's left in this campaign now, uh, so far, was getting people here to tell the story, so to, to get some momentum from that. We're taking that and, and expanding it now. We're going to have workshops throughout April and May. There's sign-up sheets for every single date that we have at the back of the room. We have a one-hour workshop where we kind of give you some talking points and, and run you through how to talk to people. It's very easy. We're going to take those people who come through the workshops together. And we're going to canvas door to door and talk face to face with Manitobans in Transcona and Elmwood. And, and the goal is to get 20,000 postcards signed face to face, raise the issue, and take those in a big bag to Lawrence Towett's office and say, Canada is paying attention. And that writing, I think Brother Paul spoke to that, that writing swings on 400 votes. 400. 20,000 postcards presented is going to make a difference. And we're doing this in 10 writings across Canada. This is the first town hall. There's going to be 10 more across Canada in strategic writings right across the country. We can make this happen. We can make a difference. 93% of Canadians believe in strong public health care. They believe in expanding public health care. This is what's going to make sure that that happens. So please come sign up. Spin the wheel of misfortune. See what you get. <laughs> sign up. The postcards are at the back. Anyone who's from Elmwood Trans Corner, before you leave, please come sign a postcard. If you're not sure where your writing is, we'll be happy to help you out with that. Uh, and I think that's it for now. So thank that's you so much. That's great. That's great. Thanks a lot. So we're going to take Dennis's idea of getting off our, off our butts and doing something. And this is the first step. We've got uh, workshops that you can sign up for. We've got people at the back here telling you how to do it. It's, no, it's time to quit just talking about this stuff. It's time to quit actually taking some, start, to start taking some action. And this, it, we're giving you the, the, the perfect way to start taking your first steps here. So um, we just have one more speaker, so maybe I'll let you go, and then Maud will, uh, will, will let you have a few words. Okay. So, go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Shereen. And uh, a couple of things. I mean, uh, first of all, I uh, would have died at least three times my life if it were not for accessible health care. Uh, you can ask my mom about uh, the time that my lungs collapsed and I had to be brought to the hospital in the middle of the night. I uh, was breathing through you know, several centimeter hole in my lungs and my mom uh, and dad at the time did not have a lot of money. If we didn't have insurance, if we didn't have the availability, I would be. So, uh, you know, I, uh, through my life, uh, as a person who has asthma, and I also have severe allergies. Uh, these are not immediately life-threatening in my general everyday uh, life, but when they are not maintained, when I don't have access to preventative medicine, when I don't have access to uh, medications that I do need, when I have a reaction to something, if I eat a walnut by accident, for example, I need a $100 EpiPen, mm -hmm. and that's out of my pocket. And there have been a number of times in my life, uh, depending on my work situation, uh, you know, where, say I've been working casual jobs, where I have no coverage, which means I don't get my Advair, I don't get my medication to prevent my asthma, uh, where I'm relying on samples from the doctor's office because I can't afford it. And then there have been times in my life where I do have coverage, I do have the availability, and I can't tell you what a difference it makes in my life to just have these medications. I take them every day, and then, oh, there's a bad day, you know, there's lots of pollen in the air, or I'm exposed to something I'm allergic to, and it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. And it, what a difference it makes. And, you know, I miss less work. I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy at work because I'm not miserable all the time. Right. Uh, you know, lots of things. Um, so, you know, like, please more health care. And as well, I just began working in a doctor's office, and already, in just a few months that I've been there, it, it, it breaks my heart, you know, to see people saying, you know, I can't afford this. Um, do you have any samples of this? Because this is the only way I'm going to get this medication, is if you give me samples of this. And, you know, I've been on both sides of that now, you know, having to say, I'm sorry if you don't have any yet. So, nothing we can do, uh, you know, 
to be the person on the other side, you know, begging, so, can I please have some medication? Because, you know, it's what I need to save my life. So you're, you're talking firsthand about what it, what it means to live without a pharmacare program. Yeah, so and I, I need to really extend this so that not just, not just stem it here and keep what we have, but also to ex ex expand it. Hello. Hi. Thank you for the evening. And uh, you said you wanted to hear stories of past practices in medicine. And uh, this is the story that my mom used to tell me about my brother, who was 10 years old in 1933. So he had appendicitis, and the doctor wanted payment first. This took place out in a little community, Rosburn, Manitoba, which is west of Clear Lake. And uh, the doctor wanted the money first. My parents had no money, so the do I'm not going to name the doctor because I don't want to offend anyone. I'm sure that he's probably not practicing anymore. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Maybe he has returned in another form. <laughs> he came to the farm, and instead of going to look at my brother Nestor, I incidentally was not around, I was born in 1938, so this is 1933. He went, he, he asked dad to go to the barn first, and he wanted to see the cow that my dad was going to give him as a payment. So that was done, and then he proceeded to take care of my brother. So, I don't know if that's an interesting story, but what do you do if you don't have a cow? <laughs> don't get rid of that lost cow. You never know when that lost cow is going to come. Thank you very much. That's a great story. <laughs> Go ahead. Please. Thanks, Lord. Uh, Jason Shire from Alma Transcona. Uh, just so. Uh, Grateful to see the work being done in, in this riding in particular. Uh, so nice to see, hear the, the informative speeches, the inspiring speakers. I just want to add one thing, uh, just in terms of making the point about the fragility of the healthcare system in this country, as is the fragility of our democracy and our advancement in this country. You know, you look at the evolution here, you look at the decline and, and erosion, the potential fall of our healthcare system in this country. And if you think about the fact that this started in the province of Saskatchewan, and the reason a little prairie province could start this, starting sort of in the 40s and finally establishing something in 1962, is because healthcare is primarily a provincial jurisdiction, is it not? And on that basis, the province was able to, to create this. And of course, this is at a time of, 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 of surgence of the CCF, of the NDP, and the left, and the, the potential threat that we as people offer to this country and, and, you know, other provinces and other parties were watching. And so other provinces came on board, other parties came on board. And now the Liberal Party can take some credit for that. And even remember Brian Mulroney trying to take, uh, the Conservatives trying to take credit for Medicare at one point. My point being is that because it's primarily provincial jurisdiction, the federal involvement, when they did get involved in the adoption of the uh, National Health Care Act, the National Medicare Program, that was something that the federal government chose to do at a time of progressiveness, maybe the last vestiges of progressiveness of federal pro progress, uh, I would say because they were forced, uh, they were threatened by felt threatened by a push from the left, a push from people like ourselves. And my point is merely to say that because it is not federal jurisdiction, it shows you fragility. They can, in fact, wash their hands of this, what Canadians choose to have. And I'm just glad to see you here this, this evening. And I just wanted to know if you have anything to mention about the fact that it's, it is not federal jurisdiction, thus the fact that it's very fragile. And I just want to make the point, as, uh, as uh, you know, our, prof, our former health minister, Tim Sale, did say, the right doesn't sleep, they do not stop, and even though we do great things like this, 
they were already already it seems to me already had uh, already had a vision to try and get rid of it back then and you know they are succeeding at this point but we must be vigilant Tim, what do you have to say about that okay thanks very much we have one more person up here but I keep saying that and then the lineup keeps growing again so maybe maybe we, we probably do have to start right so let's take one more and, okay. and um, I guess I'm I'm looking in the past, and my family was affected by both uh, having a chronically, well, a child that was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and having that child, well, I didn't even meet her. My mother was pregnant with me when she had a four-year-old diagnosed with terminal cancer, and it's called galloping cancer back then. And she also had a two-year-old tot running around in diapers, and uh, my sister who was seven, whom they had to, you know, uh, my mom was able to have in the hospital. Um, but we had a program where we were allowed to bring, my mother was allowed to bring that four-year-old home and provide, and they knew she was terminal and she was not going to survive. All she was doing in the hospital was screaming, I want to go home, mommy, I want to go home. They brought her home, but they set us up with a hospital bed and home care. They gave, my aunt was a nurse, a pediatric nurse, came to do house calls and administered her shots and painkiller medication. Um, and my, uh, my, uh, our doctor, he was an old school doctor who didn't mind doing house calls. That, that's like, you know, non-existent anymore pretty much. Um, and if we, my parent, there's the residual effect too of also losing a child at that age. My mother, basically, there were no support systems back then for post-traumatic stress and all those kinds of things. So it did have a residual fan out effect on the rest of our family and uh, how we how we stayed together, or didn't. Um, but I can't imagine without without that, if you, anyone who has children here today and that other the gentleman who was just speaking about his brother and the cow, um, I can't imagine that kind of stress. And, and we do have those programs in place to where there is that cash net. But I also want to make a challenge. Brother Dennis reminded me that we have this big glass ball being built downtown called the Museum for Human Rights. And the federal government donated, I think, um, what, allocated 30 million for that. I'm wondering how much of that will, how much of it will be, how much of our health care system will be allocated, like, health care is a right. Water is a, clean water is a right. Envir a clean environment is a right. How much of that museum is going to be dedicated to all those things that we hold so near and dear? And how much of it will be a big political glass ball? Excellent. That's a big challenge that we want to have a large portion of that, that museum to our social uh, yeah, all of our yeah, social structures. Well, said. well yeah. said. Thank you very much. For Sorry, that was very kind of weird for me to tell that story. It was very well, we're all together, right? I appreciate it. We are all together. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mom? Well, I just want to say how um, deeply moving um, these statements uh, have been. I just get this stupid thing out here. And I'm out. All right, forget it. <clears throat> How deeply moving these uh, statements have been tonight, um, and to thank people for the courage that it takes to stand up and tell a story, of the, particularly of the one that you just told, uh, the great pain of going through that kind of thing, and if you would at the same time have to be fighting to find funds or to pay a private insurance company, and you, you, we know what it's like. I mean, in the United States, it costs twice as much uh, for, for each person's health care because they have to negotiate, you know, if you've been in a hospital, it's every Kleenex, it's every, you know, every visit by any professional has charged you and then, so then your insurance company's fighting with the hospital and so on. We don't have that and we don't know what that, our generation doesn't know what that's like and it, we don't need to know what it's like because it's painful enough to go through what you just described without having to, to struggle. I wanted to say just a couple of things to Rick McAlpine and, and the, the group talking about uh, reconstructing the Manitoba Health Coalition. This is fabulous and I, I really want to say that I think that we need to understand that we have to do this every generation. Every generation has to refight these rights. It's not something 
you fight once and you get it forever. Because these forces are 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 big, they're powerful, they're they're about money and they're about removing these rights. And so I, I don't even with a government that you think is more friendly than uh, than, than others. It's necessary always to have that fight. So I want to say thank you very much for that. To Susan, who talked about women in health care, thank you so deeply for that. I've been keeping a running tab of all the changes and all the groups that have been um, uh, des devastated by the, uh, by the Harper cuts. And women have been particularly hard hit. And so have Aboriginal women's health centers. That's been a, a, another area that's just been slashed. Uh, Legal Education Action Fund, the CREO, the Canadian Research Institute for the Advancement of Women, and so on and so forth. And just as the Harper government hates pure science and the information that comes from it, they hate the, 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 the push for, for progress for, for women and other groups. And I think that we need to say the same thing about the assault on unions and, and, and workers. Uh, if, if we just fight it as the assault on workers and unions, some people are going to say, oh, well, that's just they bought better, they have better jobs or better pensions or whatever than the private sector. We have to say, first of all, everybody has the right to a decent income and, and decent pension and so on. But I think we need to also fight in terms of these are assaults on basic rights that have already been fought for health and safety, for pensions, and in this case, for women. And I, I, I think when we put it in that language, that this, these are fundamental rights for all Canadians, not just for unionized Canadians not just public sector workers. I think that we really can tell that story in a very powerful way. I wanted to say thank you to Jason um, <clears throat> uh, uh, talking about um, and the fact that uh, the <clears throat> federal funds came in later and uh, that they were supposed to balance in terms of the provinces, in terms of uh, funding. What I worry about very much is that there will be enough funding left under the Harper formula that provinces will still need that money, but it will come with conditions, and that conditions will be privatization. And this is what we're seeing on the water services side. If you're a municipality and you need funding for water infrastructure, wastewater, new infrastructure, because you're growing, you cannot access federal funding now unless you go to a public-private partnership. And the federal government is using its funding capacity. These are these are municipal and provincial responsibilities, but they depend on federal funding. And I, I absolutely, it's a, it's a terrible um, gift that I have as for seeing how awful these people are, where their, their sick little minds are taking them and us. And I'm absolutely convinced that the Harper government sees this, not just as taking the federal government out of health care, but leaving enough money in there that it will be able to be used as a club to promote and, and, and enforce uh, public-private partnerships for health care. I think we need to be very clear that that's what it's about and be very, very clear with political opposition parties that they want no part of public-private partnerships for these essential services. These are fundamental rights, mustn't be taken away. The last thing I want to share with you is just my advice of a 95-year-old friend of mine who's been through every fight, she's fought every good fight in her life, and she says, you just have to keep fighting. Don't think that fighting for justice, environmental or social or health justice, is something you can do, and then once it's done, you kind of wipe your hands. She says, then she gets real riled up, and she'll say, ooh, she says fighting for justice is, oh, it's like taking a bath. You do it every day, or you stink. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Boy, that's, it. that's an image, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I want to defend the notion that the provinces ought to be the primary deliverers of, of uh, both primary and secondary tertiary care. Uh, and the, the reason is, to me is it's twofold. First of all, we're a very big country. And the notion that we could somehow deliver quality care from Ottawa scares the bejesus out of me. Uh, I just simply don't believe that's I don't believe it's feasible. I mean, it's kind of like central planning, right? Central planning just doesn't work very well. But secondly, while I was health minister, uh, I, I just was so privileged. It's an, you know, any of you thinking about running for public office, it is an immense privilege. You learn an incredible amount. You get to work with great people. It is, it is an honorable career. Tell your children that. Anyway, what we found was that across the country, there were very clear places that were doing things better than we were doing. And there were places we were doing 
there were things we were doing in Manitoba better than other people were doing. And, and that, that ferment, particularly as deputy ministers got together with issues, assistant deputies, areas of particular interest, midwifery, etc. Uh, the vibrancy of what goes on across the health system, I think has, has got to be both preserved, but also built on, because there's best practices all over the place that are not widely shared, and they ought to be. That wouldn't happen under a central bureaucracy. So let's, let's you know, seriously challenge anybody who thinks that we'll just make healthcare a national responsibility, it'll be fine. It'd be frankly deadening. So that, that's the main thing I wanted to say. I want to thank people for their stories. I seriously want people to think about whether we need to do another book like this. Uh, there's lots of authors. There's lots of groups that could gather those stories. I want the cow story in there for sure. <laughs> I want the cow story in there. I was, I was the chair of the Manitoba Medicare Coalition for six years from 1986 to no more than that, till about 1994, I guess about eight years. Uh, we did a lot of work. We made hundreds of presentations. We were in the press a lot. We were in people's face a lot, uh, political face. Uh, it's hard work, but I think we, we, we won, essentially. We got rid of a government that laid off 1,200 nurses. We got rid of a government that cut the funding programs to train people to work in, in our radiology departments. Um, you know, we, were, <laughs> we made some progress. But as Maud has just said, if you don't take a bath at least every second day, you're going to stink. <laughs> Thank, thanks a lot, Thank you, Tim. Okay, Paul, you get the last word. Just uh, while I'll brief, the last word is a thank you to this tremendous uh, crowd here tonight and the stories that have been shared. Tim is right, Maud is right. The stories are, are what make this powerful. And I agree with the, the last sister that spoke at the microphone that healthcare is a human right. I believe that we can be a country that has a healthcare system, not just the one we have now, but a bigger and bolder one, and a country that can celebrate human rights and have a human rights museum. We should not sink gold. We should do that. We cannot shrink Canada to greatness. And the message from, from many of you tonight is citizen engagement being essential. Put a gender lens on all of these cutbacks and they multiply the cutbacks, as was pointed out by Susan. And for the trade union movement, we can never be uh, isolated. We must be social trade unionists. You will see, beginning on April 29th, round two of the four million members of the Canadian Labour Congress pooling our resources and putting out a new series of ads. You will see healthcare in there. You'll see a question posed to the people of Canada on their televisions and their computer screens why can't all Canadians throughout their working life work towards a decent pension and a fair retirement at a decent age? We believe in that. Every time I hear prominent Canadians like Maud Barlow, progressives like Tim Sale, the Social Planning Council, the trade union movement, CCPA, seniors groups, this is a tremendous rainbow coalition. We've only scratched the surface. There's an adage in the labor movement, together we are stronger. The longer the line, the shorter the strike. And we need a lineup that stretches from one end of Canada to the other to reclaim what is ours. It's our Canada. It's our Medicare system. It's our country. We can win this. I think we've come to the end of the evening, but don't forget. <laughs> you can that stuff at the end. Bailey, sign up for the workshop. Get up off your butt. Get involved. As Paul said, we've all got to work together to make this happen, so let's keep doing it.